Um, I want to deal with something this morning. I believe I bless you. I, uh, I love to study the word of God and I'm an avid reader of books. I enjoy books and Kathy says I need to get more into computer stuff. I'm really computer illiterate. I have, I don't know how many computers we got, 100, 200, I don't know how many of them. We got them all over the ministry, but because of secretaries that helps me out, you know, I just tell them to do something. But Kathy, why don't you just go get on this online or some software, but I prefer to read books. That's just me. I just like books and I enjoy those things and I, I, I study people's lives and, uh, I love the Apostle Paul. I really enjoy his ministry. You know, Jesus was the word and he was the witness. If you think about it, just going all over. Didn't make no difference what happened, when, where, what. Just do what God calls you to do. And he, he wrote a scripture or this letter to the book, uh, to Galatia, to the Galatian church. And it starts in Galatians chapter 2, verse, let's start with verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I'm reading out the King James Version. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I, and I love verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Look at this next statement. And the life which I now live in the flesh or in the natural. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Why? Who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In chapter 3, verse 1, you know, if you're a cage, you'd read it like this. Oh, you stupid fish heads. <laughs> Who has made you go crazy that you should not obey the truth? And really, that's so true. It's amazing how much truth we have and yet don't obey it. How much ability and availability we have and yet not receive it. Now, people ask me, do you ever get mad at God? No, why should I do that? See, in that verse, Paul was crucified. He was sanctified and he was satisfied. That's the title of my sermon today, crucified sanctified and satisfied. I've seen some crucified people. I've seen some, uh, you know, sanctified people, but I hadn't seen a lot of satisfied people. And I don't understand why. I had one preacher tell me, well, you know, I just didn't get saved like you. I said, well, maybe you didn't get saved. Maybe you were homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical, theologically taught. You may know a lot about God, but do you know God? You see what I'm saying? A lot of people say, I know Jesse the plant. No, you don't. You know about me. Now, John Hagee knows me because we fellowship together. We've talked together. We've been on ships together with water inside the boat. <laughs> don't never talk about the Titanic when you're about ready to go on a cruise. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we were men. We sent our wives out there to find out where that water was coming from. Hallelujah. <laughs> so how do you know someone? Well, you fellowship with them. When I first met Kathy, I knew about her. But as I began to date her, then I began to fellowship. I really began to know her. Then I got married and I got revelation upon revelation. <laughs> and she did too. And you know, we've been married quite a while. And we're still learning things about each other. It's really amazing that you'll never know every secret of a woman's heart. And a woman will never know where all the places a man can hide his money. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. I want to deal with this verse here in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that verse tells me, if you're taking notes, write this down. Christianity is a religion of personal pronouns. See, we've been taught religion, but have we met Christ? Christianity is a religion of personal pronouns. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. He says, Christ lives in me. Christ loved me. Christ gave himself for me. So I want a God that I can talk to. I want a God that I can say, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesse. I like to fellowship with God. I found out that he likes to fellowship with me, that God is a personal God. People say, I wish I could talk to God. Well, he wish you could do. 
the reason why is that a lot of people pray, but they never talk to God. They pray, they do everything. Oh, most gloriously heavenly Father God. I mean, they just get into it, then they get up and leave. And that's when the real great times of fellowship come is when you sit there for a minute and say, what's up, Jesus? For lack of a better term. Depends on what culture you are. You see, and when you understand that God is a personal God. I've had the Lord wake me up many times at night. I mean, you've heard me say it before. I'm talking three o'clock in the morning. Good, wake me up. And I'm sleepy. I'm tired. I said, well, what do you want, Jesus? He said, nothing. <laughs> I said, nothing. I said, I just wanted to say hi. How you doing, Jesse? Now, I know that sounds crazy, but when you know someone, you don't mind doing that. Kathy will wake me up and says, were you sleeping? I said, no, I had to answer you. I... Sometimes she'll test me with her toe. See if I'm awake, just kind of, you know, you can tell just a little touch. If I don't move. She may not know them, but it just depends on what she wants to talk. talk and she'll, she'll hit me again. And she'll go, ah! i never forget when she made 30 years old. It was the funniest day of my life. 30 years old. Now, she's older than that. She don't look it because, you know, well, anyway. I look a lot older than Kathy. I'm only three years older, but, uh, you know, she's done things. But anyway, Nothing wrong with that. Don't get mad. Look at her. I'll kill you, boy. I'll kill you. That's okay. <laughs> and I'll never forget during the day, I said, well, you're 30 years old. She said, it ain't nothing to it, nothing to it, nothing to it. Now, when you say it that many times and that fast, there's something to it. I said, okay. Now, I was 33, you know, but she was 30. Oh, it was about one o'clock in the morning. I knew it was coming. I said, here it comes, here it comes. Jesse, are you awake? Huh? Do you mind being married to an old woman? 30. I never even looked at her. I said, God's grace is sufficient. I thought, 30 years ago, you can live it. 30 years old, that's nothing. Now, when I was 18, I thought that was a lot. But the older I get, I won't tell you something, all these numbers are dissolving. So I wanted a God who was personal. Me and Kathy have a personal relationship and a personal fellowship. We, we enjoy each other's company. You see what I'm saying? In other words, we, we do mostly everything we do is together, you know, because I, I'm a preacher or she's preaching. And she may be one side of the country, I may be another side of the country, but if she's either calling me, I'm calling her. And when we get together, we do things, you know, and then we go just, what do you want to do? Whatever, you know, and, uh, and we enjoy each other. And it's amazing that you can live with someone and yet not know everything about them. You can be saved, full of the Holy Ghost, pressed down, shaking together, running over, and yet not seeing parts of God that you need to explore. And this is what Paul is saying. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, so I don't frustrate the grace of God. In other words, why would I want to uh, irritate God who is very personal to me? See, Christian faith must be the informing, governing principle of life. People say, what do you do every day? Well, I get up every day and I set my destiny and destination according to the word of God. What would I want to do? You see, I am the architect of my life. See, I determine what's going to happen. Not the devil, not circumstances or anything else. Because see, I determine what's going to happen every day in any day that I live. Everything I do, I get up and say, today, I'm going to do something. Now, that doesn't mean the devil won't try to fight me on it, but that doesn't make any difference. I've already won. I read the end of the book. You see, and, and, and I'm convinced. My daughter came up to me the other day, uh, you know Jody, and she's a blessed. She said, Daddy, I've been, you know, I've been knowing you all my life. I said, that's right. And she, at the time of this preaching, she's going to be 33 years old. She's going to be the age of Jesus Christ. I tell you, the age of Jesus Christ. You know, when you're 33 and you go to Italy and you tell them you're 33, oh, you're the age of Jesus Christ. That's what they tell you. She said, Dad, in all my life, you just seem to uplift people. I said, well, you know, I, you know I've been depressed. I, you know, I don't like that stuff. She said, Daddy, how do you know that God's going to do these things? I mean, I know we all believe. How do you know? Can you give me something more, uh, more physical, Dad, other than some spiritual uh, phrase? I said, oh, Jody. She said, how do you know that's going to happen? And I said, Jody, I have convinced myself that God can't lie. He said, you have got to convince yourself. 
to the point that God can't lie. And I'm going to do a whole sermon on that glory to God. I have convinced myself, Matt. I mean, I, I just know it. He can't lie. I said, Jody, have I ever lied to you? She said, no, never. I said, she said, why? I said, why should I? I said, when I tell you something, you've taken it to the bank since you're five years old. It doesn't make you, when I tell you you can do something, you just do it. Have I ever returned, I said, or pulled something back that I said? She said, no, dad, in all the years, you never have. I said, why? I said, I want my word to mean something. You see what I'm saying? Well, God wants his word to mean something. Now you see people, and I'm, I said this in the first service, I'll say it again. I really have a hard time sinning. I got to make myself. I got to get in the flesh to do it. I'm never sending my spirit. You don't send in your spirit. You send in your flesh. The devil never tempts you in your spirit because he's spiritually dead. He can only tempt you in your flesh. But if you crucify your flesh daily instead of Sunday, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's one of the most amazing things to me. How many people say, I couldn't help myself. Lie, you fry. <laughs> yeah, you can help yourself. Sure you can. But it's going to take some discipline, some dedication, and some commitment. In other words, you're going to have to convince yourself that God can't lie. Now, when I look at uh, things that are impossible and everything I've ever done was impossible, my ministry is an impossibility. I mean, what, what I got to believe God for, what you have to believe God for, to every day to keep a ministry running will drive most people into stress management. I mean, you got to understand. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's amazing how many millions and millions and millions, millions of dollars you need to operate a world ministry. And it's daily. It ain't, I mean, it's going on all the time. And yet, Jody says, Dad, Daddy, you have never struggled in the financial area. I said, no, why? I said, I've convinced myself God can't lie. He said he would supply my need. But then it dawned on me, that's not my need, that's his need. Lord, I'm doing what he said. I'm not doing what I said, I'm doing what he said. So certainly he will meet his need. Now the reason why I can talk to God like that, he's personal to me. That's what Paul's saying, I am crucified. Christ lives in me, Christ loved me, Christ gave himself for me. So Christian faith must be the informing, governing principle of life. I call it an energy of spirit. See, that's what faith is to me. Faith is an energy of spirit kindled by the consciousness of what Christ has done for us. Not what he's going to do, what he's already done. See, I, I always never forget what he's already done for me. And so it gives me great power for the future because I'm the architect of my life and I flow in that anointing in that kind of way. And people say, yeah, but it, it may not work. Yes, but it will work every time if you've convinced yourself God can't lie. But what you going to say, see, I never accept the doubt part. I'm not denying it. I just don't accept it. I get on an airplane that don't, I don't know how to fly it. I just know how to buy it. <laughs> but I have two men that know how to fly it. So it'd be very stupid for me to say, well, y'all get out the seat and let me fly it. <laughs> that would be stupid. I wouldn't be here. I've had people say, why do you sit in the back of a plane? Have you ever heard of a plane backing up into a mountain? So I'm the last one going to get hit. You understand what I'm saying? I'm stuck in the back back there. You see, so I allow them to do their job. Because I'm convinced, Matt, that they can fly that plane. Now, there are circumstances that are happening when you're flying called turbulence. People say, how come you don't have trouble like a lot of Christian people? I fly above Christian turbulence. I just ascend to a higher level. It's called growing to the fullness of the stature of Christ. I want to grow daily. Not just at special meetings. You see, I'm crucified. Then when the devil says you're not much, I say, no, no, I'm sanctified. I'm set apart from anything that you have. I'm an alien. I mean, I've, I, I pick up godly things even in movies, live long and prosper. I like that. That blesses me, you know, I think that makes sense. You see, I realize that God can be anywhere at any time if you're looking for him. See, that's that energy of spirit. I stir up the gift of God in me. I'm a, I'll tell you something that most people don't believe, but I do it. I go stand and look in front of a mirror and go, Jesse, 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 Jesse. <laughs> Listen to me, boy. Listen to me. Listen to me. You got it, boy. You got it. You got it. And my mind says, what we got? What we got? I said, man, I got God Almighty. Greater is he was in me than he was in the world. If God be for me, who could be against me? Hey! I say to that mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. Go away, just go away. I preach myself happy. I've spoken in tongues watching myself and interpreted it in a mirror. I've, I, I've given an offering and received an offering in a mirror. 
People say, that's crazy. No, 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 no. What's happening is, is it's that personalness. Man, I tell you, I've been praying so God came down and said, I got to get a part of this revival. <laughs> just come on, Jesse, what, what are we going to do today? How many times he said, what are we going to do today? I said, well, you don't know what you're going to do. You my hands, son. You my feet. You see, and when you understand him and in high operates that the, that the heart of God is that father, that the face of God is the son Jesus, that the voice of God is the Holy Ghost, but the hand of God is Jesse. The hand of God is the church. If God's going to get something done, he's going to use your hands to do it. Do you see that? Now that's personal. See, that's personal. And fine, God likes to hear nice things. I found out that Kathy likes to hear nice things. I've been married to her, and she says, you know, she says, uh, she likes to hear. In fact, that God jumped on my case about four weeks ago. I was flying home. He said, I want to talk to you about Kathy. I said, what? <laughs> he said, you need to tell her you love her more. I said, Lord, I've been married to the woman for me. She ought to know that. He said, she knows that, but she needs to hear it. I said, I'm sorry. He said, do that when you get home. I said, okay. I got home. I walked over there, and, I, and she was on her computer, stuck back there. She said, I want to tell you something, Kathy. She said, what? Now, when she's on the computer, don't mess with her, because she's going to give you that look like, what? What? <laughs> you know, because, you know, she's doing something. Her mind's on something, you know. More she's just going to that. I said, Kathy, I want to let you, do, I want to tell you something first. Here. First thing first, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> you see, she she amen that, glory to God. I said, you are the best thing that has ever happened to me. And I just want to let you know that I love you. I mean, you know that, but I want to let you know you're the best thing. Her hands came off the, thing, off the board. She went, ooh, Jesse. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. I can't tell you no more. <laughs> hey, it worked. Hey. I thought, this is good. This is good. And the Lord said, she liked that. And then I transferred it to God. I said, God, I want to tell you something. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. And the Lord went, ooh, Jesse. <laughs> See, that's personal. That's what Paul said. Silas and Paul beat, slapped the piece of bleeding like a stuck hog. <laughs> Most people would be saying gloom and despair. The agony on me, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. And the Paul says, sing, Silas. Just sing. Sing. You've got to be kidding me. Sing. Come on, boy. Sing. <laughs> Why? Why couldn't he do that? God was in that place. That doesn't mean trouble is not around you. You see, people say, what do you believe in? Well, Christianity is not a series of doctrines to be adopted, a code of morals to be followed, or a church to be joined, but a person to be received, trusted, and obeyed. That's what Christianity is. A person to be received, trusted, and obeyed. Not a moral code. People always ask me what I believe in. I believe in Christ, the hope of glory. Now, I ain't mad at Muhammad. I ain't mad at Buddha. I just prefer to serve somebody living. Now, I'm not mad at nobody. You do what you want to do. I just prefer to serve somebody. How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? Bless God, because you're talking about it 2,000 years ago. No. And his enemies said they did it. You got to understand something about Jesus. He started out with an impossibility called the virgin birth and ended with an impossibility called the resurrection. Amen. And God started it right out of the garden of Eden when he judged Adam and Eve, looked at the devil and says, I am going to send one. You're going you, to bruise his heel, but he's going to bust your head. How many of y'all saw the passion of the Christ? Did you see it? How many of y'all like this? Oh, when he stomped that snake, I went to shouting right there. People say, what do you like about that passion? You notice in the movie, I'm talking about in the movie now. In the movie, Jesus never talked to the devil. That devil just talked to him. You can't get the sins of the world. He just said, Abba, Father. You know, you need to quit talking to the devil. And that I know of in the scripture, after Gethsemane, Jesus never spoke another word to the devil. Now, he did before. But in the movie, Mel Gibson movie, he didn't talk to the devil at all. The devil kept talking. He just said, Abba, Father. One man said, well, what do you think about the violence? I said, I saw no violence at all. I just saw cruelty. That's called the cruelty of sin. I see people thought that, was, you know, it was like, you know what I thought every time that cat of nine tails went down? You know what I did? I said, there goes cancer. There goes diabetes. There goes high blood pressure. There goes crippling arthritis. There goes infectious disorder. There goes ever name disease that's named upon the earth. That's what I saw. Lord Jesus. Well, what about him he's carrying a cross and he fell and Mary comes there and says, I'm here, I'm here. You didn't hear Jesus say, man, I'm hurting Mary. I'm hurting bad. You understand what I'm saying? 
He said, no, I'm creating a new day. What you got to do as a Christian, when you focus on your priority, you eliminate all confusion. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not looking at confusing things. You've got your mind and your eyes set on one thing is to complete your destiny and reach your destination. You see what I'm saying? If you focus on your priority, you eliminate all confusion. So Christianity is not a series of doctrines to be adopted, a code of morals to be followed, or a church to be, be joined, but a person to be received, trusted, and obeyed. It is not the church that made the gospel. It is the gospel that made the church. See, we reverse that. It's the gospel that made the church. Not the church made the gospel. The gospel was here before the church got here. You see, something was birthed in man. Glory to God. You see, that's what made me is the gospel. That's what changed me. Sure wasn't a church. I went to church all the time. Knew a lot about God, but did not know God. Had a mama made, drug me to church. Two grandmas trying to get me saved. Like that drove me crazy. One was four foot nine, the other's four foot eleven. Two of them didn't make one whole person. <laughs> trying to get me to marry a girl in the church. I told her I was going amongst the Philistines. <laughs> I want a greasy Delilah. Come on. My grandma would have a flaming fit. Jesus, take us now, Lord. I said, take both of them, Jesus. <laughs> I had some great grandmothers. But it would not change me. Why? Because the gospel could only change me. The church couldn't. The gospel could. Let me say it again. It's not the church that made the gospel, it's the gospel that made the church. You see, now when you understand that, beware of being independent of your maker. You ought to write that down if you're taking notes. I, have, I do things that most people would never think. When I go to purchase a vehicle, I, I hardly ever do that anymore. Most people go do that. But when I used to do that, I'd go with God. I'd walk slap on that car place or a truck place. I said, the Lord sent me here. They say, who? <laughs> they just look at me like some fruitcake, but that's all right. I'm the one buying the car. I said, the Lord sent me here. I had one man say, well, I thank God that God chose Ford. That's <laughs> what he said. He, boy, he's excited. I said, I'm looking for this particular kind of van. He said, we got one. I said, that's it. That's what the Lord said right there. I see it. The Lord just spoke it to me. He said, well, let's go look at it. I said, this is what the Lord going to pay for it. He went, whoo, the Lord make a good deal. I said, he's Jewish. <laughs> he don't pay retail. And neither do I. Now, I said, are you going to sell me this truck for what the Lord said, or you want to go to hell? What you going to do? He said, you, the truck's yours, sir. Now, now, that sounds crazy, but see, I have personal relationship and fellowship with God. He said, go buy my truck. <laughs> Pastor John like that. Glory to God. That's personal. That's relation. That's with God. People say, I don't believe that. You don't have to. You're the one paying full amount. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. This is God's business. I'm going to stand before God to be a steward of his money. I am not going to go up there and say, Lord, I did the best I could. I don't want him to, I want him to say, well done. I don't, I don't want him to say, well. I need a little bit more than well. You see what I'm saying? Beware of being independent of your maker. I used to thought I could do good business until the Lord said, won't you take me in there with you? I can do some things you never thought possible. He said, I'll give you a favor where you didn't have any. I'll give you an insight, a concept, and an idea that no one has ever heard of. Oh, man. I drove by a piece of property one time, and the Lord said, buy that. I said, okay. I bought it for $335,000. It's now worth two and a half million. <laughs> That's hearing the voice of God outside the church, not just inside. It's called good business. See, that's personal. That's Paul doing the same thing. Man, he, Paul asked for a coat, and he had, just, he had just established a church 50 miles away, and yet a man brought his coat 1,500 miles away because they didn't care for the man. Yet he established that church. Triumphant brought that coat 1,500 miles when there was a church 50 miles down the road wouldn't bring him something to you know, bring warmth to his body in that prison. But I love what he said. He didn't say, I, he didn't say, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, I'll fought a good fight. Jesus tarries and I die. I'm going to have me a good death. You ever heard of that before? A good death, which means death is not going to win at the end. I'm going to do what Jesus said. Father, in your hands, I commit my spirit. Glory to God. That's called a good death. 
Peter said, I'm soon to lay this tabernacle down, but I'm going to stir you up one more time. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished this course and I kept this faith. I'm getting out of here. Instead of saying, oh, Lord, it's coming. No, no. I don't want to be independent of my maker. How many times have had the Lord say, what are we going to do today? You heard me say that a while ago. What do you want? Oh, Lord. He said, come on, I'll back it. Let's go. Let's go do something. I had a pastor friend of mine one time. He'd get depressed all the time. I don't know what was wrong with the boy. I go over to his house. He, I said, what's the matter? I, they're having problems. I said, well, get rid of them. He said, well, that's easy for you to say. You travel and I have to stay here. I said, you know, you need to get stirred up. Come on with me. I took him down to the, some of the worst streets in New Orleans. I'm talking about sin thick as it can be. Put a microphone in his hand and said, preach the gospel. He said, what? I said, we're going to stir up every devil in hell on this street today. Let's preach the gospel. Just they did lie by kill us. I said, you saved? He said, yeah. I said, so what? Preach the gospel. What are we going to do here? So he started out. <laughs> There's people walking. Would y'all like to meet Jesus Christ? I said, there ain't nobody going to meet Jesus Christ like that. Come on, suck it up. Come on. Get excited about the gospel. He said, nah. I said, come on. I said, come on. I said it'll, it'll drive your depression and your discouragement away from you in seven ways. So I just begin to shout, glory! Right on the street, on Bourbon Street. Glory! People look at me. Glory! People look at me. I said, hey, the word of the Lord is here to go. Ah. And then you got to do that John the Baptist fire licking hell preaching kind of stuff. Boy, we started. It wasn't, it wasn't 30 seconds. He was screaming, shouting, praising God. People began to cry on the street. Give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some were mad. People were spitting at us. You just got to dodge it. You know, just do that. Go on, do what you got to do. I mean, I don't like that kind of stuff. It's not the issue. But sometimes you do what you got to do. We finished preaching. We had about, well, I think it was 12 people got born again. I'm talking born again. We make them kneel on the streets. I'm talking crying. I said, now be at this church. We had three hookers get saved. You should have seen that. They came to the church, had the little short dresses, and, and people said, don't, 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 don't let them kneel down. Don't, 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 don't let them kneel down. Remember that? We got them born again. They start crying pounds of makeup coming off them. Eyelashes, everything you can think of. Those girls are still in the church. That's 20 years ago, and added 150 people to that church in a matter of six weeks. Six weeks. But how, how did you know I'm crucified with Christ? I'm convinced myself he can't lie. When you understand that, then that sanctified stuff comes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. See, Kathy set me apart for salvation. The Bible said you, that your spouse is, is sanctified. Your unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. Not saved, but set apart for salvation. So it's their tough look. They married you. It's their tough look. They were born to you. You got the promise of a family down to a thousand generations. But let me give you a revelation. See, I can promise you something. People think the Bible's full of God's promises. There ain't one promise of God in that Bible complete. You know, when words fall from the lips of God, they're not promises, they're prophecies. Let that sink for a minute. See, if I walk up to you and say, we're going to believe God for your healing. And Jesus said, by his stripes you were healed. Well, that's a promise of God, right? Yeah. So we'd receive that. But if I say this, thus saith the Lord thy God concerning your body in the power of Jesus' name, rise and walk. All of a sudden, something changes. What changes? You went from a promise to a prophecy. When I tell you something, it's a promise. But when, a promise, but when words fall from the lips of God, promises are prophecies. It had no other choice. I had to get saved because I had a believing mama. She said, I don't care how bad you get. You're going to get saved whether you like it or not. That's a true story. Now, I know that's hard, but that's the truth. And I thought, that crazy woman. She said, it's going to happen. God promised it to me. Then I realized after I got born again and started to preach it, that was a prophetic utterance coming out of her mouth. To her, it was a promise from God. But to God, it was a prophecy to her concerning her children. Isn't that amazing? I'm crucified with Christ. I'm sanctified, Lord Jesus, and I'm satisfied. You got, you're looking at a man that's happily saved, if that's a right statement. I just enjoy being saved. I do. I, 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 I just enjoy God. I get up every morning. There ain't nothing in the world better than meeting God. 
I mean, I've flown at 58,000 feet at Mach 2 in the Concorde, and he was there. I said, Lord, we moving fast. He said, I've done been around this jet a hundred times, boy. You don't even ride how fast I'm moving. I thought, my Lord. I said, Lord, he said, I'm flying you at Mach 2 to get somebody saved. You see, people think it's luxury. It ain't got anything to do with luxury. It has to do with destiny. God, I'll send you all over the world to touch one person. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's destiny. He's got people on his mind. The greatest miracle God had, he counts his wealth by the souls he possesses. Not like pearly gates and gold streets and things. And there's nothing wrong with pearly gates. There's nothing wrong with any of that. And yet the church was preached against that. Why? They all want it. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. One lady told me, but Jesse, I don't want to get too much. I said, come here. Have you ever had too much? She said, well, no. I said, how do you know what too much is? She said, well, I don't want to get greedy. I said, you have been greedy? She said, well, no. I said, what makes you think you're going to get greedy? I know a lot of poor people are greedy. and don't have anything that's still greedy. Money don't make you greedy unless you just accept greed. You see what I'm saying? Greed can be on anything. Trust the God that trusts you. See, so beware of being independent of your maker. I decide to flow in that every day, not just Sunday. Now, Kathy's the same way. My Lord, she'll get up usually. I go to bed later than she does. She gets up earlier than I do. And man, and I go to bed with God, and she gets up with God. I tell her, I walk in there, she's got that cup of coffee and that Bible in her hand. And she's sucking that coffee, and she just, she look at me, she says, fresh meat. Let me tell you what the Lord said. I said, what, man? She done got a revelation. She done got a, she done got a message. Sit down, I'm going to tell you what God said. My Lord, it's running 24-7 at our house. Why? We enjoy it. We just don't talk to God on Sunday. We talk, we even go to church on vacation. Can you believe it? <laughs> you know what we did? Was it last year? Year before last, we went on a motorcycle trip with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, Dennis and Vicki Burke, uh, uh, Happy and Jeannie Caldwell, Jesse and Kathy Duplantis, and Jerry and Carolyn Savelle. My God, I guess I, it, it, Kenneth Copeland just had to preach. He turned around and said, let's rent us a room in this hotel. I said, you mean we're going to have our own mini convention? Man, we in motorcycle stuff. He said, yeah, we all got in this one room. We rented the room. I'm not talking about a hotel. We rented a little room. And, and bless God, Kenneth turned around and said, what the Lord tell you? What the Lord tell you? By the time I got, everybody was interrupting everybody. Everybody was just preaching to each other. We came out of there on fire. You are me walking out of glory. People going, my God, them people end the vacation, aren't you? Lord, look out. We stirred up the gift of God. We do it daily. When somebody gets mad at me and tries to criticize me, I just laugh at that kind of stuff. You see, because I'm going to live longer than they are. And I'm going where they're not coming, so it won't make that much difference anyway. <laughs> Unless they get born again. You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's going to happen. People, you're going to be criticized in this life. But so what? Paul said, I've been beat five times with rods. So what? So what? See, <laughs> You got to think of the end more than just what's going on in the middle. You see, I, I've seen the end. I know what it looks like. I went to the book of Revelation and looked over. I thought, man, God. He said, nice place, isn't it? Yeah. He said, now what are we going to do now? I said, let's go. You know why I like to read the book of Revelation? You know, it's the only book in the Bible but most preachers tell you not to read because you're not going to understand it because they got too many signs and different kinds of different things and they're all kind of, you know, metaphors. Do you know it's the only book of the Bible that says, blessed is he who readeth it. You empowered to prosper. It didn't say you have to understand it. It said blessed, empowered to prosper is he who readeth it. And yet most people never read the book of Revelation because they don't think they're going to understand it. And it says it in the first chapter, blessed is he who readeth it and then understand that this prophet is. You're automatically blessed just for reading it. Y'all should have shouted right there. I just set you free. Just, just simply read the book. Just read a chapter in it. God said, I'll empower you to prosper. That's what blessed means. Now you got to understand that. Yeah, see, but we're so concerned about sin. Sin really isn't that. Sin's already been taken care of. We don't have a sin problem. We have a sinner problem. See, Jesus already took care of that. What we need is how to get a sinner out of sin. Sin is not just another name for imperfections and mistakes. Sin is rebellion against the will of God. That's what that is. It's missing the mark. When I saw the passion of Christ, I realized Jesus was crucified not by nails, but by my sin. 
Nails just held him there or just, you know, held his hand. But my sin held him on the cross. Pilate killed Jesus with his cowardness. Judas by his love of money. The high priest by the love of power. The Pharisees by their self-righteousness. The mob by their preference for Barnabas. What sin did you crucify Jesus with? You see, I realize that. Wait a minute. He went to that cross for me. Now, let me explain something here, getting into a theological debate here. You got a lot of people really get concerned about, did Jesus go to hell or did he go to paradise? You know, all kinds of things. You, you want to get into, did Jesus die spiritually? He did not die. You want to get into some really a theological debate. You can get into this thing. Well, the Bible said he was made sin. He was not made a sinner. See, if Jesus had been a sinner, he would have had to repent. Nowhere in the scripture, nowhere do you find Jesus repenting. Why? He was not a sinner. He did, he did not commit sin, but he was made sin. See, that we might become the righteousness of God. We were never righteous, but we were made righteous. See, simply because of what he did, I received it. He paid my price. Now, all I do is his work. You see my point? So he was not made a sinner. A lot of people think people are saying that. No, he was made sin. A sinner has to repent. Jesus didn't repent, didn't need to, because he never committed sin. Then he told me something. I heard it all my life. You got to sin every day. And the Lord said, that's not true. And I go long stretches of time without sinning. Because I crucify myself, I'm sanctified, and I'm satisfied with Christ. That doesn't mean I have not had temptations. That doesn't mean the devil didn't try to get me to sin. You know, I ain't the ugliest man in the world. I get hit on every once in a while. Can you believe it? Can you? I'm talking about girls that could be my daughter. I think it's so stupid. I know what they think. He got some money. They're right. But they ain't getting any of it. That is so silly to me. I just made up my mind. Man, I, I'm more than physical. A woman to me is more than some physical body parts. Parts wear out. I got enough sense to know that. I just made up my mind. Wait a minute. Glory to God. What's more powerful? My hormones or me? Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Listen to me now. You say, I'm crucified. I'm sanctified and I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with Jesus. I'm satisfied with Kathy. I'm satisfied. Jody to said, Daddy, you happy? I'm satisfied with Jesus. I'm satisfied with my Christianity. I'm satisfied with my wife. She's satisfied with me. <laughs> yes, she is. Glory to God. Hallelujah. She told me that the other day. She said, you know, I'm so glad I married you. I said, thank you. That made me feel good. I said, well, you know, I said, we're doing this thing together, girl. We started out together as sinners. Both of us just dog sinners. She got saved, then I got saved, and we started out in the ministry together. She'd do whatever it needed to be done. I remember my first tapes, Lord. Jesus, Kathy put the labels on them. Typed with a Smith Corona typewriter. <laughs> Hallelujah. She didn't have to type much. I only had three sermons. <laughs> Hallelujah. We just decided to believe God. Just jump out by faith. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. You don't do it because I did it. Let me say this in close. You do it because God told you to do it. I just jumped out by faith. I made up my mind. I don't care if I stop. I'm going to preach this gospel the only way I know how. And I never wanted to preach. I don't mean this arrogantly. I can play everything on this platform. I can do this. This is what I did for a living. I know how to play this stuff. But God told me to come here. I said, I don't want to do that. Don't, I don't know how to do this. He said, that's why I'm sending you. I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, isn't that wonderful? Since you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to know when you made a mistake. <laughs> Because you don't know what you're doing. He said, you're going to walk by faith and not by sight. I said, I better get into the scripture. I began to study ferociously, if that's the right word. I mean, I just, I attack the scripture. My Lord. And I thought, man, I can only come up with three sermons. So after I preached three days, I was out. I had to go to another town. I said, I don't have no more. He said, yeah, you got more than you, you ever thought. He said, why don't you just step up there and start speaking? Uh, uh. I mean, I'm talking, praying for the rapture of the church with sweat running down my legs. <laughs> it is not easy to do this every week, getting something new. You don't realize what's happening. All of a sudden you get a great sermon and the Lord don't let you preach it. But you let me study it all week. He said, you needed it. That's not for them, that's for you. Oh, no wonder it was so good because I was feeding on it. <laughs> it wasn't for anybody else, it was just for me. When Kathy started preaching, she said, I'm not like you. I said, you're not supposed to be like me. I said, Kathy, God will send you to places 
that will help you train. He will train you by, by nice people. In other words, he going to let you preach in front of them and they already heard everything. They know all that and they're going to shout you down. Amen. So you can hone your, your, your skill as the spirit of God blesses you. I think some of the greatest preachers ought to be preaching to some of these kids. We get some of the lousiest preachers to preach to children. No wonder they're bored. We can understand that if somebody just starting out, glory to God. You and Adam, you've been in church a lot. You can understand if somebody just starting out, you know, well, praise God, he's doing good. Oh, she's doing good, praise God. But a child don't understand that. So I decided we have to give these kids life and that more. But you would be surprised what's happening in our ministry. We got children in our nursery, brother, that are on fire for God. I'm talking kids. We had a kid going there not too long ago that was sick. And I think she was three and the other one was three. And he says, don't you know what the word of God says concerning healing? <laughs> this is the three-year-old talking to the three-year-old. He said, no, I don't want you crying all day, aggravating all of us here. <laughs> this is what the kid said. He said, I'm going to lay hands on the power. God going to touch your body. Jesus, he just slapped her, baby, pow, like that. She, she went to the ground, man. <laughs> These are three-year-old kids. He said, how you feel? She said, I'm healed. He said, let's play. <laughs> I am not exaggerating. Those kind of things are happening in the nursery. We're preparing them for the future. We're making God personal. The other day, I got reprimanded by one of them, four years old. Every time you come in here, Brother Jesse, you eat our snacks. <laughs> I said, I bought them. She said, you know, I heard you preach that do anything whatsoever you desire when you pray. She said, pray for your own snacks. <laughs> I, I said, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Kid ate my lunch. But they had a really beautiful church. She said, but just I'll give you some of my snacks. I said, thank you. But just one. Let me say this. I do not let Jesus bear the cross alone. I'm crucified with him. You criticize, Christ, you criticize Christ, you criticize me. I can take the heat. I'm made in his image and in his likeness. So I expect people to say terrible things about me like they said about Jesus. That's okay. I just smile at him because I don't let him. Cru I'm like that Simon's serene. I'm going to help him with that cross. You see. I don't let him be crucified by himself or carry that cross alone. I'm crucified with him. Now, how do you do that? Let me close with this. Holiness is always positive and aggressive. See, I decide to be holy for I am holy. It burns away the hateful germs of sin. Holiness is love in action. Now, for years, I thought holiness, well, I was told this, that holiness was how you looked by what you wore. I found out that was just simply not true. I just called bad taste. <laughs> I never forget the first time I went to a Pentecostal church. I said, there can't be no lust in here. That's the ugliest people I've ever seen in my life. Don't get mad at me now. I said, ain't, ain't nobody going to be falling for these women. This is gag a maggot ugly women in here, buddy. They need to go home and put some makeup on their face. Something. I'm, not, I'm just telling you what I thought. I thought, Lord Jesus, ain't nobody going to be running around here. They call that holiness. I call that bad taste. It was one of the most amazing things. I, I was amazed at that. I said, why did they put their hair on their head so high? Maybe they want to be taller. I couldn't get over that. First time I ever came in contact with a Baptist was at vacation Bible school. I never heard of vacation Bible school in my life. I was christened and confirmed a Catholic boy. We went to, cat we had did a catechism, a vacation Bible school. Would you like to go to vac vacation Bible school? Well, first thing we weren't allowed to read the Bible. You don't read the Bible. Only the priest can read the Bible. It's the way it was. If you've been Catholic, they don't do that now. But in those days, they did. I didn't. Man, I, I enjoyed vacation Bible. And one lady said, "I'm a Baptist." I said, "Why?" <laughs> I couldn't understand why wasn't everybody going to be Catholic. Then mom and dad got saved. I never heard that word in my life. Jesse, would you like to get saved? From what? <laughs> saved. Then I heard this. Would you like to be born again? I said, I was lucky. I was born once. That's what daddy said. <laughs> That's what daddy said. 
I said, Mama, you said I wouldn't have been born because he, he didn't want me. He didn't want you to have another baby, but you fooled him. <laughs> Women are controlling the world. That's a fact. It's happening everywhere in any place. You can ask a man anything. You better ask his wife if you want to know the real thing. In fact, I did that a while ago. I said, hey, John, what about this? He goes, Diane, what about that? <laughs> Diane, just come out with that. Boom, boom, boom. He said, you get it, Jess? I said, I got it. I said, we can do it. Kathy goes, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You got to check this. Because they, they end the details. When we were on that cruise, if you're not coming on that cruise, you need to come. I'm telling you, if you can, I mean, I'd get in a lifeboat if I was you. I'm telling you, we had some fun. And we had water come in the boat. And I love, Pastor John said, Diana, why there's water in this boat? <laughs> Diana, she said, I, why, why do I have to know that? <laughs> I'd never been on a cruise in my life until I went with Pastor John Hagen. He asked, me, he asked me to do that. I said, John, I don't have time to do it. Oh, yeah, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy it. He said, we're going to preach a lot. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to enjoy it. So I went. First time in my life. I couldn't believe people eating 12 o'clock at night. A thousand people eating like hogs at 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> Just eating up a storm. Because I knew we were going to have a healing service. We had to have a healing service. Lord, every time I pray for people, they're burping. I'm going, what? <laughs> they just, excuse me, bud. They just, that pepperoni pizza tore us up bad last night. We need a healing today. <laughs> we just prayed for people. We just enjoyed having, having fun. Even the people that worked the plane, plane I mean, the, the ship, came into the services. It was great. It was a blessing. I have never been around gospel music like the Tallies. I enjoyed myself. I couldn't get over that. You know, I'm used to... You know, I was a sinner. I never heard half them songs. I listened to all that. I said, look at this. This is great. <laughs> I didn't even know. We didn't get around those kind of things. I saw people happy. Then I realized something. They were crucified. They were sanctified. And they were satisfied. People tears in their eyes. Just enjoying it. We had fun. We even had a gong show. And Matt was the, was the MC of the gong show. I mean, you had to get in good with Matt. He just gonged you. you. Some people walked in and he went, get him out of here. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> we blamed everything on Matt. You got problems with your room? It's Matt's fault. Talk to Matt. <laughs> we had fun. It was great. I hadn't had that kind of fellowship. I never, you know, and one man came up to me, and I'll close with this. He said, you know what? I've been on seven cruises. He said, I'm not into this God stuff. He's lost as a goose in a fog, man. He don't know God. I said, why'd you come? He said, well, I like that Hagen. I like you. He's mad. You glad. I like y'all. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he said. He's mad. You glad. I fell out. I said, what? <laughs> I didn't forget that guy. He said, well, I watch y'all faithfully. I ain't into this God stuff. He said, listen, y'all done shut down all the booze. Can I get a drink around here? Yeah. <laughs> I said, we're going to some new wine. He said, I take any kind of wine. Just get some. I said, we're going to get you saved. Hurry, quick. I'm thirsty. <laughs> he got born again on a Wednesday night. Tears in his eyes. Hallelujah, Lord. I thought, man, God, what are you doing? He said, crucify, sanctify. See, ain't nobody going to get saved unless they see that your Christianity is satisfying to you. You understand what I'm saying? You got to be satisfied. If you want people to come to your church, you ought to get them and go, whoa, glory to God, it's Sunday. Wow, we're going to church. Most people go, are y'all sick? Something wrong. But are you that excited to your delight in his commandments? This is my last closing. <laughs> I would guess this is probably the most enjoyable thing me and Kathy like to do. We enjoy giving. 
You got to know the difference between giving and receiving. Now, I've been blessed greatly. I've had people give me some beautiful things. When someone gives you something, you get excited. Oh, 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 that's a blessing. It, and it blesses the flesh. It blesses the soul. But when you give something, it's more blessed to give than to receive. If you notice, for, so I can make a spiritual term a physical term. Notice that when you receive something, which is nothing wrong with it. You need to be with somebody, bless you with something, a new dress, whatever. It just makes you feel. You, you go, oh, this is great. Oh, this looks good. But when you give something, there's a warmness comes out of you. See, that's your spirit. If you want to know the difference between your spirit and your soul. Soul is the mind, the will, and the emotion. It's dealing with the, with the flesh, the body. But, but when that warmness comes, you don't get that warmness when someone gives you, you go, you get excited. Wow, man. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you. That's a blessing. Hallelujah. But when you say here, and somebody thank you, there's a warmness comes. That's why Jesus was saying it was more blessed to give. See, you have satisfied that individual. You have blessed that. Me and Kathy love to do that more than anything else. Gloria Copeland told me, she said, you know, other than Brother Copeland, you know, of all, she said, Jesse, you understand that. I, I do. I love being a blessing. I love teaching people to be a blessing because see you, it's just one of the most amazing things when you can meet somebody's need. God gave me some money one time, but it wasn't enough to do this particular project that God wanted me to do. And I said, Lord, I said, Lord, he said, is that me, Jesse? Will that meet the need? I said, well, no, Lord. He said, then maybe it'll meet someone else's need. I said, you want me to give this money away? It was $37,000. I was believing God for 75 to do a television show. $37,000 came in, Matt, in a matter of like, a, I thought I was pretty, this was years and years ago in the, in the early 80s. In a matter of like two weeks, I thought, praise God. He said, Jesse, is that me? I said, yeah, Lord. He said, no, Jesse, is that more than enough? I'm the God of more than enough. Is that me? Is that more than enough? I said, you don't want to tell God he's short. <laughs> I said, well, no. He said, so that's not enough to meet that need? I said, well, no. He said, well, then maybe it's enough to meet someone else's need. I said, Lord, you want me to get this money away? He said, I was going to just put it in the bank and save it until I get my 75. He said, is that me? I said, is that more than enough? I said, no, that's not more than enough. I said, but it is enough to meet someone else's need. And all of a sudden, my secretary called and said, there's a gentleman I need to see you. I said, bring him on in. And he was going to Bible school. He said, but Jesse, I'm going to Bible school. I just want you to pray for me. I'm, I'm, I'm heading out. I said, well, how you going? He, I'm hitchhiking. I said, you hitchhiking? Yeah, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to get me a Bible degree. He said, I'm going to school. I said, you got any money? He said, well, I got about $8. <laughs> he said, but I don't care. I'll get a job at a Burger King if I got to. I am going to school. I said, uh, how much money would it take for you to handle all this year to go? You know, with your tuition, all kinds of stuff. He said, $37,000. <laughs> I said, isn't that amazing? <laughs> I, got some, I got just enough to meet your need. He said, oh, I didn't come here for you to give me that. I said, no. I said, but the Lord sent you here. He found me to be sensitive. I said, let's pay for your whole school so that way you, don't, you can just be a black. He busts out crying. I was crying with him. <laughs> that was one of the most wonderful things I ever did in my life. This was years and years ago. I said, God. He went to school, got his degree. You know what he did? Came back, gave me all his books. He said, you paid for these books. I paid for his second year too. I decided I'll just pay you college. And he came back, he said, I wanna, these are my books. I just want to put them in your library. It blessed me so much. Ladies and gentlemen, in a matter of three days, God sent something like $50,000, excuse me, $35,000 over what that budget was. He said, Jesse, is that me? Is that more than enough? I said, that's you, Lord. That's you. I'll never forget. Never forget. And I made up my mind. That would be a blessing to his men. Now, when you preach something like this on television, people write you and say, would you pay off my house? 
No. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's not because I can't. It's because you've made me your source. And you cannot do that. God has to be your source. Now, he does use people. But God must be your source. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Did you enjoy it today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at a man who is satisfied with God. I'm satisfied with my fellowship and my relationship with the Lord. I look forward to more conversations with God. Man. Let me ask you a question. Normally I would turn your service to pastor, but if I, could I do this altar call? Would that be all right? I just felt. <laughs> Maybe you were like me growing up. Yeah, I went to church a lot. I did. I knew a lot about God, but I did not know God. I didn't know him. If God would have walked through the doors of our church, I'd have thought he's a visitor somewhere. Just play me something soft, brother. Be fun. Thank you. I, I could tell you a few Bible stories, <laughs> but I did not know God. I knew religion, it, and it bound me. I want to ask you today. Would you let me introduce you to God? It's called getting saved for the very first time. You might know a lot about God, but do you know God? Man. If you ever meet this man, this Jesus, you'll never leave him. Oh, I, could, I could say it much better in tongues. That's the only way in it. Because English is not big enough to speak of who he is. Now, I used to stop there because that's how I was trained as a minister. Till the Lord arrested my mind. He said, take it further. Maybe you're in this building today and no. You're not backslidden to hell by no means. But you're not living the way you should live. I don't know. Maybe a preacher hurt you. A Christian hurt you. Maybe I hurt you. If I did, I apologize. Would you give me the honor of going to the throne of God with you today and say, Lord, here's a man, here's a woman. They've had some tough times, Lord. But like that old Texan says, tough times don't last. Tough people do. So, Bow your heads, please. If you'd like to know God, which means getting saved, instead of just knowing about him. Or, and be honest with yourself, you're not where you should be with God. And you need to come back to him. Would you lift your hand up? Thank you, I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. Can I see others quickly up in the balcony? Thank you. Now that lifted hand means one of two things. You want to know God which means getting saved for the first time, or that lifted hand is saying, I've got to be honest, I'm not where I should be. And I need to come back to God. Can I see another hand quickly? Thank you, I see that hand. Yes, I do, thank you. Up in the balcony, I see your hands, thank you. Could I see one more? Thank you, I see those hands. Look at the people, thank you. I want all of you to look at me. I would never lie to you people. John, I've never lied to you and I never will. I've never lied to you. You can count on me being your friend forever. And I mean that. I'm that kind of a man. Many of you lifted your hand. That took some integrity, boy. Thought about it for a minute and you went, yeah, that's me. I'm going to ask you to do something harder than this. I know I'm taking a little time, but I'm going to ask every one of you that lifted your hand, not some of you, because that took integrity to do that. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come stand here. In front of everybody? What's wrong with that? Jesus hung on the cross in front of everybody. If you're in the balcony, it'll take you maybe one minute to walk down. 
Get out of your seat and come give your life to God. Give them a hand clap as they come. Look at the people coming. My God, my God, my God. Isn't that good now? Woo, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. I'm going to ask you to say it with your heart and confess it with your mouth. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody in the audience, you're watching my television, how can I ever forget you? I got saved watching television. I thank God for Dr. Billy Graham who preached the gospel to me. But I thank God for the partner that supported Dr. Graham to get so he could get to me. <laughs> I owe that person my soul. They thought enough of me, and even they, though they didn't know me, to have a man preach the gospel to me. See, it's not the church that made the gospel. It's the gospel that made the church. Pray this prayer with me, you by television and everyone in this building. Let's repeat it together. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and forgive me of all my sins. I confess my sin. Before you this day, I denounce Satan and all his works. I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me, for bringing me back to where I once was. I believe with my heart, I confess with my mouth that Jesus rose from the dead. I am saved. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And today is my God day with the Lord Jesus. I pray this prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Isn't that good?